once again, welcome. Welcome to the Cultural Integration Fellowship and thank you for joining us this morning. We were founded in 1951 by Dr. Haridas and Veera Chaudhary at the Center of Universal Religion and Spiritual Practice. And in keeping with the spirit of unity and diversity, we honor the spiritual traditions of diverse cultures and religions. Today's uh, talk is titled Sri Aurobindo and the Integral Yoga. And it is going to be presented by our own Santosh Krinsky. Santosh has been studying Sri Aurobindo's writings since 1971 and has a daily blog at wordpress.com and podcast at anchor.fm slash Santosh dash Krinsky. The details are there in the announcement. So, you know, just look up these websites for the details. Santosh resided at Sri Aurobindo Ashram from spring 1973 through winter 1974. He is the author of 17 books and is the editor-in-chief at Lotus Press. He is the president of the Institute of Holistic Education, a nonprofit focused on integrating spirituality into daily life. He has spent more than 48 years building and developing infrastructure for publishing, distributing, and, edu and educating about the spiritual path of Sri Aurobindo, as well as developing and guiding companies at the forefront of publishing books and distributing books and products to support the natural market, as well as the metaphysical market in North America. For more information on the writings of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, you can visit lotuspress.com as well as visit the daily blog postings that I've already given details of and the web page at aurobindo.net. Before I hand over the screen to Santosh, I want to read a poem from Dr. Haridas Chaudhary. It is titled Life and it is from this collection, The Rhythm of Truth. Life is the self-painting of the spirit on the canvas of time and space, gradual unveiling of the infinite in nature's sweet, silent embrace. On the limitless expanse of the ocean, life is the rising, soaring undulation. On the bosom of the absolute void, it is the outburst of joy unalloyed. In the heart of all encompassing darkness, it is the sure conquest of light in harness. Right in the midst of chaotic disorder, it is the principle of harmony and order. Life is the play of hide and seek between spirit and nature. Spirit hiding in a deep dark veil, nature tries to discover. As nature moves forward in pursuit of spirit's hidden treasure, life leaps forth into radiant glory in ever increasing measure. Let's meditate on those words for a couple of minutes.
Welcome. Welcome back to the Culture Integration Fellowship, Santosh. Over to you. Namaste. I was asked to uh, speak about Sri Aurobindo and his uh, yoga, and I thought, how can I presume to speak about Sri Aurobindo and his yoga? And so it occurred to me that maybe I should let Sri Aurobindo speak for himself. And so today I propose to uh, provide some insights that Sri Aurobindo has himself given about his life and his yoga. And let Sri Aurobindo say for himself what it is he's here to do, how it is he's here to do it, and what the significance of that is for the future, the world, the evolution, and for those of us who find meaning and significance in what Sri Aurobindo has set before us. In 1971, I left college abruptly based on a call that I received and went to Europe. I didn't know why. I didn't know the purpose. And I went there and I waited and I thought somehow it would be revealed to me. And I met a philosopher there who was studying Rudolf Steiner and Ospensky, and we had regular conversations. And then one day he came to me and said, I've got an American girlfriend who uh, I bought this book for, and it's not her personal interest. I thought you might be interested. And he put in my hands Sri Aurobindo's The Life Divine. And I randomly opened the book. It's a thousand pages or so. I randomly opened the book to the chapter, The Aim of Life, Four Theories of Existence. And at that moment, as I started reading, I realized that the call I had received, the search I was involved in, was being answered so clearly that it spoke to my deepest being. I didn't need to question it. I didn't need to involve the rational intellect. <clears throat> it simply spoke to me somewhere, somehow. And then I started reading through the book systematically. And I realized that Sri Aurobindo provided a complete understanding of our human condition. He starts with the human aspiration. What is it that we, we human beings, seek for? Why are we here? What are we alive for? What is it that motivates and moves us? And he said, God, light, freedom, immortality. And if we reflect on what human beings do, our science, our philosophy, our religions, we're seeking for those things. And then he goes on and he describes one direction, which he calls the materialist denial. And he says, basically, those individuals who follow that guidance believe that the reality is this material world within which we live and we're here to fulfill ourselves and aggrandize our lives. And then he goes on to talk about the refusal of the ascetic, the person who says, no, no, it's not this, it's not that, it's something other, it's something not this external material world. And he set forward the dilemma, 
the contradictions that we all face in humanity should we go for fulfillment of our external life or should we follow some spiritual or religious impulse and abandon the material life as an illusion, as meaningless? And he answers that question in the next chapter, Reality Omnipresent. He reconciles the two extremes and shows that each one has a real meaning and significance and that we need to merge the aspiration of the West, the materialist denial, with the aspiration of the East, the refusal of the ascetic, to create a new integral way of life on earth. And that made so much sense to me that I gave up all other forms of thought and seeking and said, how can I be true and live this aspiration? And in some 48 or 50 years since then, I still ask myself those same questions <laughs> because every day we're confronted with these challenges. Now we see people and you know, it's it's the 150th birth anniversary of Sri Aurobindo this year on August 15th. And we honor that. And we're, as de devotees, we respect and pay homage to that. And that's right and good, but it can't stop there because Sri Aurobindo has clearly indicated it's not about being worshiped, it's not about having a religious fervor. It's about people taking up and living and integrating the spiritual seeking that Sri Aurobindo undertook, not as some unique, example, but as someone who was a forerunner on the path. In 1935, Sri Aurobindo stated, I had no urge toward spirituality in me. I developed spirituality. I was incapable of understanding metaphysics, but I developed into a philosopher. I had no eye for painting. I developed it through yoga. I transformed my nature from what it was to what it was not. I did it in a special manner, not by a miracle. And I did it to show what could be done and how it could be done. I did not do it out of any personal necessity of my own or by a miracle without any process. I say that if it is not so, then my yoga is useless and my life was a mistake, a mere absurd freak of nature without meaning or consequence. You all seem to think it is a great compliment to me to say that what I have done has no meaning for anybody except myself. It is the most damaging criticism of my work that could be made. I also did not do it by myself, if you mean by myself as Aurobindo did. He did it with the help of Krishna and the divine Shakti. I had help from embodied sources also. My sadhana is not a freak or a monstrosity or a miracle done outside the laws of nature and the conditions of life and consciousness on earth. If I could do these things, or if they could happen in my yoga, it means that they can be done and that therefore these developments and transformations 
are possible in the terrestrial consciousness. What an incredible statement. Sri Aurobindo tells us, don't just worship and forget. Don't go to the Church of Aurobindo on Sunday and forget about it the rest of the week. Understand and take up the methods that I've developed and practiced and uh, integrated into my life and become that which I am becoming. If you respect, if you honor, if you believe in what you see in me, that's Sri Aurobindo, then become that. Don't satisfy yourself with worshiping from afar. If that's all you can do, do it. That's fine because it brings you closer. But the reality is that if we're going to transform human life on earth, we need to become that. We need to begin to change human nature one person at a time starting with ourselves. Sri Aurobindo made it clear as he gave us another indication. And the quote is, it is not Sri Aurobindo's object to develop any one religion or to amalgamate the older religions or to found any new religion. For any of these things would lead away from his central purpose. The one aim of his yoga is an inner self-development by which each one who follows it can in time discover the one self in all and evolve a higher consciousness than the mental, a spiritual and supramental consciousness, which will transform and divinize human life. So if we take Sri Aurobindo at his word, if we believe what he says, if we honor his vision, then it's pretty clear that we need to turn our That's devotion bad. into practice. And begin to grapple with all of the issues, all of the contradictions, all of the struggles that the existing human nature that we all embody puts up as a conservative resistance to the evolutionary development and growth of consciousness. That resistance is not bad, it's not wrong. It's part of nature's process to ensure that there is a solid step forward, that we don't just leap into an abyss of confusion and conflicting ideas and vital impulses. And so it's good that we have some amount of resistance within ourselves that we can confront and challenge and say, is this the way forward? Does it provide an integral understanding? Does it provide a step towards the new consciousness and the new human being or possibly beyond human being that's intended to evolve and carry that next evolutionary stage of consciousness forward. Sri Aurobindo was also very clear that he wasn't seeking large numbers of devotees and didn't want to advertise what he was doing, he'd rather have a smaller number of people who were dedicated to actually practicing this yoga. Uh, 
just as I guess uh, Jesus chose his 12 disciples, uh, Sri Aurobindo basically said it's not quantity of people who adopt this path, it's the quality of the individuals who are willing to put their lives on the line. He states, I don't believe in advertisement except for books, etc., and in propaganda except for politics and patent medicines. But for serious work, it is a poison. It means either a stunt or a boom, and stunts and booms exhaust the thing they carry on their crest and leave it lifeless and broken, high and dry on the shores of nowhere or it means a movement. A movement in the case of a work like mine means the founding of a school or a sect or some other damn nonsense. It means that hundreds or thousands of useless people join in and corrupt the work or reduce it to a pompous farce from which the truth that was coming down recedes into secrecy and silence. It is what has happened to the religions, and it is the reason of their failure. And you know, I reflect on this virtually every day. I'm in the book publishing business. I publish Sri Aurobindo's books in the United States. And I, yes, I advertise them, but I'm, I'm very conscious that I have to stay on this side of the line, I can advertise the books, but not work to start a movement or a religion or any other, as Sri Aurobindo puts it, damn nonsense. So uh, it's something that really is real to me. And I know a lot of devotees believe, honestly believe, that getting more people involved and going out and expanding the teachings and bringing in lots of individuals is somehow a benefit. And maybe in the broadest sense of the term, the texturing of consciousness across the entire world newosphere, it's not a bad idea. And so I am always encouraged and I always support when the concepts, the ideas, the focus, the direction that Sri Aurobindo points to is put forward in some way, shape, or form, whether or not they mention Sri Aurobindo. I honor the energy of the force of the concept and don't worry about giving whether those people give credit to Sri Aurobindo, because somehow, somewhere, the idea has touched them at the universal level. They don't know where it comes from in many cases, but it's true because it's changing the mental understanding of humanity. We are different today at the mental level than we were 50 years ago. We understand the oneness of life more than we did 50 years ago. We understand the symbiotic nature of life. We're more concerned about achieving balance and harmony. Obviously not everybody adopts this, but Humanity as a whole has made enormous progress from the days when a person's skin color or gender or orientation meant total suppression, slavery, beatings, death, poverty, to the, to the time today where awakened individuals across the world recognize that things have to to change if we as a species are going to survive and thrive on this planet and carry things forward. 
And that, to me, is the best homage that we can pay to Sri Aurobindo, that the concepts and ideas he developed, put forward, organized at such great length are finding purchase in the world, secretly, occultly, but beginning to change the texture and feeling of the consciousness of the planet. That's a mar remarkable thing. So what does this mean for us? Those who appreciate support and want to take up the yoga that Sri Aurobindo has shown us. And the mother indicated, Sri Aurobindo came upon earth to teach this truth to men. He told them that man is only a transitional being living in a mental consciousness, but with the possibility of acquiring a new consciousness, the truth consciousness, and capable of living a life perfectly harmonious, good and beautiful, happy and fully conscious. During the whole of his life upon earth, Sri Aurobindo gave all his time to establish in himself this consciousness he called supramental and to help those gathered around him to realize it. Sri Aurobindo has come on earth not to bring a teaching or a creed in competition with previous creeds or teachings, but to show the way to overpass the past and to open concretely the route towards an imminent and inevitable future. And that means that those who are moved by Sri Aurobindo's teaching, by Sri Aurobindo's presence, who have love and devotion towards what Sri Aurobindo represents in the world, we have that opportunity. It's our burden to take up that yogic practice and change human nature within ourselves. Sri Aurobindo stated, the yoga we practice is not for ourselves alone, but for the divine. Its aim is to work out the will of the divine in the world to effect a spiritual transformation and to bring down a divine nature and a divine life into the mental, vital, and physical nature and life of humanity. Its object is not personal mukti, although mukti is a necessary condition of the yoga, but the liberation and transformation of the human being. It is not personal ananda, but the bringing down of the divine ananda. Christ's kingdom of heaven our Satya Yuga upon the earth. Sri Aurobindo wrote most of his major writings between 1910 and 1920. Some of them he edited and refined, but one writing stands out by virtue of the fact that he worked on it until 1950, the year when he left his body. And that is Savitri, a legend and a symbol. And in Savitri, he sets forth in radiant and inspiring terms, his vision of what the world can do and be and what we, those who follow afterwards and who are moved and inspired by this same force that moved and inspired Sri Aurobindo, 
And so I'd like to read a short passage from Savitri. I saw the omnipotent flaming pioneers over the heavenly verge which turns towards life come crowding down the amber stairs of birth forerunners of a divine multitude. Out of the paths of the morning star they came into the little room of mortal life. I saw them cross the twilight of an age, the sun-eyed children of a marvelous dawn, the great creators with wide brows of calm, the massive barrier breakers of the world, and wrestlers with destiny in her lists of will. The laborers in the quarries of the gods, the messengers of the incommunicable, the architects of immortality. Into the fallen human sphere they came, faces that wore the immortal's glory still, voices that commune still, with the thoughts of God. Bodies made beautiful by the Spirit's light, carrying the magic word, the mystic fire, carrying the Dionysian cup of joy, approaching eyes of a diviner man, lips chanting an unknown anthem of the soul, feet echoing in the corridors of time, High priests of wisdom, sweetness, might, and bliss, discoverers of beauty's sunlit ways, and swimmers of love's laughing fiery floods, and dancers within rapture's golden doors. Their tread one day shall change the suffering earth and justify the light on nature's face. the role of the devotee, the disciple, the follower of Sri Aurobindo is not simply to worship Sri Aurobindo and create a new religion, but to put into practice the teachings, follow the path and realize the truths that Sri Aurobindo was able to reveal about the divine manifestation and the evolution of consciousness. Om Tat Sat. I don't want to break the silence, so I was just wondering if we could meditate, you know, for for a few minutes actually and then we'll come back to the group and have conversations.
Thank you so very much, Santosh, for this wonderful presentation. It's still feeling the silence. Usually, the mind begins shattering, you know, after talks, and I think the power of the words get lost. And that was the reason I thought that it would be good to have a meditation. And I personally felt that it was a beautiful overview of Sri Aurobindo's integral yoga, coming from Sri Aurobindo himself. You know, what are the essential characteristics of the yoga? So thank you very much for reminding the salient aspects of the yoga. And, uh, you know, August is when we celebrate the birthday of Sri Aurobindo. There will be more talks in this particular month, specifically focused on Shorbindo. And once again, the idea is very simple. You know, it is about inner and outer transformation. And uh, as Santosh pointed out, I too believe that, you know, that the fellowship stands for, um, for concentrated work and very much in line with Shorbindo. And our predecessors. I've never believed in the numbers. You know, it is about having a focus group which is which is committed towards inner and outer transformation and bringing about transformation in as many ways as possible, in different ways as possible. You know, it's 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 a diverse world. It's a plural world, and of course, all of us are going to interact with the yogic scheme. in specific ways, in, in, in our unique ways. So thank you very much. Um, let's open the group for conversations, comments, questions. Please raise your hand, unmute yourself and come in. Yeah, Margaret. Santosh, I assume that you were there was inner guidance in your choice to use Sri Aurobindo's words rather than talk about Sri Aurobindo. So I think it's helpful for you to know from those that experienced this talk today that it allowed the mantric power of Sri Aurobindo's words containing that force to really have that powerful influx of force and um, light. So um, what Kundan was saying and when we had the meditation, um, I'm sure all of us could experience, even though you channeled this this morning, that we received uh, the full power and radiance of Sri Aurobindo's words. So thank you so much. Well, you know, when um, Kundan asked me to speak today, uh, I was a little shocked and thought, how can I be so presumptuous to describe Sri Aurobindo? <laughs> and for a few days, I just was in sort of a state of, why me? <laughs> why should I do this? And then it became clear that... Um, Sri Aurobindo can and should and does speak for himself. We can't do that. And that that's how this happened today, that uh, it just sort of grew on me as, uh, as the panic of trying to intervene in describing Sri Aurobindo and his work uh, overtook me at the request. <laughs> Uh, hi, Santosh. This is uh, Mike Hebel here in San Francisco. Santosh, you indicated that the one work that Sri Aurobindo continued to work on through his whole life was Savitri. You also told us that I think the, the major works that he had done were done in a 10-year period. 
30 or so years earlier. Do, do you have any uh, inclination or did Sri Aurobindo say why savagery um, was a work that required such continuous work and development? The intimation that I've received from studying these things and what Sri Aurobindo and the mother both had to say about it was that uh, Savitri embodied a mantric force of realization and that he continued as he gained new realizations, as he gained new powers of understanding, as the higher forces built themselves out and exposed levels of humanity that uh, needed to be looked at, uh, he was moved to continually incorporate that into Savitri so that it would provide an impetus and power of realization uh, for anyone who picks it up and reads it with sincerity and without uh, a chattering mind, you could say, just quietly allowing the mantra to create its images, to build within oneself and and carry that force. And my own experience with Savi Tree was, was interesting. I was living at Tree Aurobindo Ashram in 1973. And I thought, how can I even read Savi Tree? <laughs> um, and so I started with the very first canto of the first chapter and decided that I would understand it only if I could really understand the language. And so it was the hour before the gods awake. And I thought, I need to really look up the nuance of the words across the path of the divine event, the huge foreboding mind of night alone in her unlit temple of eternity lay stretched immobile upon silence march and i started reading that and i thought okay i better go to the dictionary and really reflect on the nuances of every word chosen and as i did that and i went through that first canto i reached a point where i felt everything was utter darkness and despair. It was the mind of night. And it had just filled me with that darkness. And then something, there was a long, lone line of hesitating hue. There was, there was a line that just suddenly I felt in my heart that there was a, um, a spark something broke through the darkness. And the next line in that canto was, a hope stole in that hardly dared to be amid the night's forlorn indifference. And it awakened me to the power of Savitri because he could create within the receptive soul the very power and force of what he was seeing and experiencing. And he could then move you to a new framework, a new understanding, a new energy, a new hope. And as I read other sections of Savitri, the same thing happened uh, in book 11, the eternal day, He's talking about, I mean, he's just giving us all of these beautiful images and forces and music and sounds and everything. And then he breaks the spell by saying, the measure of the subtle music ceased. And at that moment, I woke up and realized I'd been entranced in this energy and he was consciously making us aware of that inner movement, 
so that it wouldn't just be some experience that was ephemeral, ephemeral and comes and goes, but actually helps us to recognize the power that Savitri holds for the transformation, not from an intellectual standpoint, but from uh, an inner transformational standpoint. Thank you. Hi, Santosh. <laughs> Just thank you so much. That was such a beautiful presentation. I really, really loved it. Thanks for sharing your experience and your wisdom. And I loved hearing the passages from his writings. It's just so beautiful. It makes me really want to read Savi Tree. So mm. I'll have to make that a lifelong goal. <laughs> but yeah, I've never read his work before. So I really appreciate you sharing that with us. It was beautiful. And it's great to see everybody today. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Santosh. Um, please. Unmute yourself. Uh, Santosh, I, I, what you just said about Sabatri is, of course, what many of us feel from the incredible mantric poetry in Sabatri and from his, his other poetry, but but I, I would make a strong pitch for the same kind of qualities, the same, the very same qualities in his prose mm -hmm. that we, we can find the same, the same force, the same power in each word of his prose, his paragraphs that go on for, or his, sentences that go on for a paragraph or a page or two pages if we, we we need to break them down we need to disassemble and let them reassemble themselves uh you know i i find that i can i can swim in those words we swam in those words the prose that you uh uh you spoke to us today in, in your in your reading um so I just wanted to to make that pitch. I, I love Savitri, but uh, but but the prose, if one gives attention to it, and it requires absolute attention. This is uh, not easy reading, as we all know. Uh, but but that same quality is there in 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 the prose. Some of us are more taken to prose, and some to poetry, but it is it is all there and. So thank you for this, uh, such a wonderful short summary, a half an hour, uh, a tour, a tour de force of, of Sri Aurobindo as we approach uh, August 15th. So thank you very much for that. Well, you know, I, I agree with you about the prose. Um, back in 2009, I came to the conclusion that I was reading Sri Aurobindo's writings too fast uh, for the entire time from 1971 until that point. And I said, I don't know that I can really <laughs> absorb what he's saying and what he's communicating, just sort of devouring page after page as was, you know, the way we read books. Okay. And so I started my daily blog, not for anybody else but for myself and i said i'm going to go one page a day and i'm going to really reflect on it i'm going to look at that passage and i'm going to try and understand it and add my own unique reaction perspective whatever to it so that it becomes me rather than just something i read and let it go and now, uh, you know, it's been, uh, what, 14 years, 
and the blog is still going on and it's gone through all of the prose works, the major prose works, uh, the life divine, the synthesis, the essays on the Gita that, uh, I mean, just on and on. And now we're looking at um, compilations. Uh, the one I'm working on right now is called Our Many Selves, Practical Yogic Psychology, which compiles writings of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. And again, it's it's basically one passage or page a day. And it slows me down so that I can really grasp and grapple with what they're trying to communicate. And I just share it on the blog because others have said, as you said, well, it's hard. There's so much material and we don't know how to really grasp it all and deal with it. And I thought, well, I'm going through that experience. I can share that experience sort of collectively with everybody. And uh, many times people have their own comments and they add them and, and it's encouraged. It's wonderful. Uh, sometimes yeah. people have asked me, you know, why aren't you just citing Sri Aurobindo's paragraph? And I say, well, because I want to actually internalize it. I want to make it real to me and you should make it real to you, not just be able to parrot back the words, but to actually appreciate and understand what they mean and what they do to some degree. Each time yeah. we read this, we get a deeper layer of it, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't take those steps. So thank you. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's very good for us to share the ways that we read to increase sort of the breadth of people's understanding about the way to do this. Your your way was was more out there with you with your blog. Mine was much more quiet and private. Mm -hmm. Uh I I slowed down maybe even more than you did, uh, even less than a page a day at <laughs> times. And my 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 way was to literally touch the words. Uh, I've used a a PDF reader, good reader, mm. and uh, for for all the volumes and and I I move I, I actually literally touch the words in electronically uh, on the PDF reader uh, by highlighting them maybe even lifting important sentences out and putting them in another place to, mm -hmm. to really, really, and, and having a dictionary right there uh, readily available for so many of the words to understand the nuances. So I, I think this is uh, an important exchange about how we read Sri Aurobindo and the difference between the prose and the poetry and we each have our own ways. So and enough said, but I, I appreciate this uh, this exchange. Thank you. <clears throat> if I may add just a bit, you know, to this ongoing conversation. The mother would say that one of the best ways to read Shurabindo's writings is to silence the mind and invoke the grace. Mm -hmm. I have found that, you know, the writings begin to make complete sense, and uh, and even prose, you know, appear poetry to me. And uh, you know, it's my experience is very similar to what Earl was talking about. Bowen, please <clears throat> come in. Uh, thank you, uh, Santosh. I just wanted to again, like like everyone else, thank you for the way you. Did this presentation i think um, for some of us who have been in a teaching role uh in some sense or it's it's been a dilemma i think it is a dilemma how to teach your window or even to teach your window mm -hmm. and i think you put it very nicely in, you know in that way uh second thing that caught my attention was your emphasis because there's so much else you could have also brought in but your emphasis on the part that Shrebina talks about, 
that I didn't do this by myself. You know, in some sense, he takes himself outside, out, you know, and, um, and I, I find that very difficult and very promising at the same time. It's, it's really hard to um, overcome the ego because the ego is not just some characteristic that's not good. The ego is this just very basic way that we are. And to be able to really utilize it in the way that he he calls for it is is not easy. But but one thing that has made it easier for me a little bit is that um, even though Shirovindo's works and his capabilities are immense compared to many human beings or other beings, perhaps, um, I don't know if it's necessary for us to compare ourselves in any sense to, to, to him, like to think that I should know so much poetry to be able to write a poem like his or to write an article like, you know, or to, because it's just a different story. And I think you all started to point to this direction in the past few conversations that I, I think what it what's more necessary is to just light a candle within us to really want spiritual development and and his words are so great and so full that each of us will find something in it where we can find a thread for ourselves and kind of go at our own pace. But somehow I think there's a lot of progress that can be made if we're not intimidated by the immensity of his philosophy and his intelligence. And um, in some sense, I think the mother's work is very helpful because it contains a lot of I, I don't know what some people call spiritual intelligence, you know, something that is about how to conduct a spiritual life rather than so many other things about spirituality. So I think, you know, I really appreciate this initiation that I believe you have done to inspire us to kind of bring in these new ways of, of really capitalizing on these teachings for ourselves. Bowman for your comments. I see Linda's hand up. <laughs> um, I want to thank both you, Santosh, and Kundin, because after Santosh's last talk, I was on Kundin. You know, it's such a shame that we don't have these recorded so that we could go back and listen to them. And Kundin promised me that he would have you back and others back many times. So don't be surprised if you're asked to come back again. Um, and he was, Kundan was saying, I, I kind of like the intimacy of having a smaller group. Um, and it, it's really, it's so true. It really, I was, I was kind of just feeling things wash away. And I'm a very out there, extroverted person. And to be able to come back from the farmer's market to this, is quite precious. So thank you both for it. Thank you, Linda. You know, this focus for the last few minutes on how to read, how to absorb, how to connect with, with something like this, it, 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 it's such a fun trip because it's like we were talking about Sri Aurobindo and the philosophy, and then we went into a thing of how to read, and it, that was a very deep teaching that happened spontaneously. That wasn't part of the agenda. <laughs> so, isn't it great how those things can happen spontaneously? And it's so easy uh, for me to read something that's a lot and feel intimidated by it, and not intellectually or theologically prepared for it, or at at a point where I can really grasp it and just, you know, I'll come back to that some other day or some other year, but there's another way to approach it. So uh, I appreciated this presentation on uh, multiple levels. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Roger. There's this car horn which was disturbing the peace. I'm glad it stopped. <laughs> More comments? 
questions for Santosh? Thank well, you, everyone, for joining. Uh, Kundan, yes, yes, I Jim. would add one thing, and that is that during our meditation, uh, one of Sri Aurobindo's mantras was occurring to me, and I thought I would share it to close us out here. So, Please. Om Tatsavitur Varam Rupam Jyotihi Parasya Dhimahi Yanaha Satyena Dhipayet. Om, let us meditate on the most auspicious form of Savitri, on the light of the Supreme, which shall illumine us with truth. Thank you very much, Santosh. Yeah. Namaste, everyone. Bye bye. Namaste. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Satoshi. <laughs>